Welcome to the physics classrooms video tutorial on refraction and lenses. The topic of this video is Snell's law of refraction and we want to know what variables affect the amount that light refracts at the boundary and how can you mathematically predict the angle of refraction. I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. When light crosses the boundary between two different materials, there will be a change in speed, a change in wavelength, and a change in direction. This change in direction is what we refer to as a refraction. As an example, consider a boundary between air and glass. And let's suppose that the light is within the air, approaching the boundary. This is referred to as the incident ray. At the point of incidence between this light ray and the boundary, we can construct a normal line, a line drawn perpendicular to the surface. And once we do, the angle between the normal line and the incident ray can be measured. This is the angle of incidence. Because light refracts at the boundary, it won't travel along a straight line path, but instead will bend either towards or away from the normal line. For the case of air traveling into glass, the bending will be towards the normal line, and the refracted ray will be located in this region. The angle measured between the normal line and the refracted ray is known as the angle of refraction. Because light is bent at the boundary, the angle of refraction will not be equal to the angle of incidence. And the more refraction that takes place, the greater the difference between the angle of refraction and the angle of incidence. The amount of refraction that occurs at the boundary depends upon two variables, the angle of incidence and the materials located on opposite sides of the boundary. When light approaches the boundary while traveling along the normal line, the angle of incidence is zero degrees and there is no refraction whatsoever. But as the angles of incidence are increased from zero degrees to larger and larger values, the amount of refraction increases dramatically. The amount of refraction also depends upon the materials on opposite sides of the boundary. Here we see light passing from air into water, into glass, and into diamond. The angle of incidence is 45 degrees in each of these three situations and the index of refraction of the starting material, air, is 1.00 in each of the three situations. What's different about these three cases is the index of refraction of the material into which light is passing. In the case of light passing from air into water, the incident ray will bend and the light will be located 13 degrees closer to the normal line than the incident ray was, making the angle of refraction 32 degrees. But when light passes from air into glass, the amount of refraction is 17 degrees, placing the angle of refraction at 28 degrees. And in the case of light passing from air into diamond, the amount of refraction is 28 degrees, making the angle of refraction 17 degrees. This data provides evidence to support the claim that the amount of refraction that takes place at the boundary depends upon the difference in the index of refraction of the two materials. A common physics lab involves the use of a hemicylindrical dish of water. Laser light is directed towards the midpoint of the flat side of that dish of water. The light refracts towards the normal line and enters into the water. It exits the curved side while traveling along the normal line at that surface and does not undergo refraction. The angle of incidence in the air and the angle of refraction in the glass can be measured and a data set can be collected that would look something like this. The the experiment is then often repeated, but without the dish of water. Instead, the water is replaced with a hemicylindrical disk of lucite glass. If the data for both of these experiments is plotted as the angle of incidence versus the angle of refraction, we would observe that the line is relatively straight for the smaller angles of incidence, but then begins to curve more and more for larger and larger angles of incidence. But if the sine of the angle of incidence versus the sine of the angle of refraction is plotted for both of this, these experiments, we get straight lines. The slope of the line can be computed. It comes out to be about 1.33 for the air to water boundary and about 1.50 for the air to glass boundary. The y-intercept is zero in both of these situations. We can use y equal mx plus b to write an equation for the lines on these graphs. For air to water, the equation would be sine of the the angle in air is equal to 1.33 times the sine of the angle in water. And for the air to glass boundary, the equation would be the sine of the angle in air is equal to about 1.50 times the sine of the angle in glass. As is the case in science, we would like to generalize from the experimental findings found under certain conditions to a more general conclusion that works for all conditions. So for the condition of light traveling from air into water, 
we can make the observation that the 1.33 and the 1.00 in the equation are the index of refraction of air and of water. And for the condition of light traveling from air into glass, we can make the observation that the 1.50 and the 1.00 in the equation are the index of refractions of air and of glass. So this leads to a more general conclusion, a law of refraction known as Snell's law that can be stated in equation form that looks like this. N1 times the sine of theta 1 is equal to N2 times the sine of theta 2. In this general equation, the N values, N1 and N2, represent the index of refraction of the two materials on opposite sides of the boundary. And the theta values, theta 1 and theta 2, are the angles of incidence and the angles of refraction as measured with respect to the normal line. This is known as the Snell's Law equation. In a typical physics course, the Snell's Law equation is often used to solve physics word problems in which you must predict the angle of refraction. Here is an effective strategy for approaching such problems. First, read the problem carefully and identify and record the known values. Snell's Law equation has four variables in it, so you'll need to know three values in order to solve for the fourth. Express your known values in terms of the symbols of the equation as shown here. Second, identify the unknown value in the problem, like theta r equal question mark. Third, construct a diagram in order to help visualize the situation. A ray diagram works fine. Notice how in my ray diagram I've recorded the known values on the diagram. Fourth, Substitute the known values into the Snell's Law equation and then perform proper algebraic manipulations in order to solve for the unknown value. And then finally, ask yourself, is my calculated answer reasonable? For light traveling from a material with a small index of refraction to a material with a larger index of refraction, the light will bend towards the normal line and the angle of refraction should be less than the angle of incidence. The opposite is true for light traveling from a material with a large index of refraction to a material with a small index of refraction. Use this understanding to check if your answer is reasonable. This is the first of two example problems in which I show how to use that five-step strategy to solve a physics word problem. I begin by reading the problem carefully and identify the known values. I know the angle in the air and I know the index of refraction of the two materials. I record these in terms of the symbols of my Snell's Law equation. I'm looking to calculate the angle of refraction, that is the angle in the glass. Here's my physical picture of the situation. You'll notice how I've recorded my known values on the diagram. Now what I'm going to do is substitute these known values into the Snell's Law equation. Here's the substitutions. And then I'm going to perform the algebra in order to solve for the angle in the glass. Here's where it could get difficult for many. I'm going to begin by evaluating the left side of my equation using my calculator. Make sure your angle mode is set to degrees on your calculator. When I evaluate my left side, I get this. Notice I'm not going to round any numbers until I get to my final calculation. The next step is to divide both sides of the equation by 1.52. Once I do that, I know that whatever the angle in glass is, its sine value is 0.5506553. So to solve for the angle in glass, I'm going to use the inverse sine function. That's usually two buttons on your calculator, the second button and the sine button, but it can vary per calculator. The angle in glass is the inverse sine of the 0 0.5506 blah blah blah. Now using my calculator, I can find out that the angle in glass is about 33 degrees. This is reasonable because 33 degrees is less than the angle of refraction of 39 degrees. That's what I expect for light traveling from a material with a small n to a material with a large n value. In my second example, light is in glass and heading towards air. I begin by recording what I know. I know the angle in glass, I know the index of refraction of glass, and the index of refraction of air is 1.00. I'm looking to calculate the angle in the air. I'm going to complete my diagram by drawing the refracted ray. Since glass is more dense than air, the refracted ray will be further from the normal line than the incident ray is. A reasonable answer for the angle in the air will be one that is greater than the 18 degrees, the angle in the glass. Now I'm going to substitute no values into the Snell's Law equation. And I'm going to evaluate the left side of my equation with my calculator and I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 1.00. Now I'm looking for the angle in the air that has an 
sine value of 0 0.4687058. So I, div so I take the inverse sine of this value, and on my calculator, the value is 28 degrees. That's reasonable, since 28 degrees is greater than 18 degrees, which is what I expect for light going from a material with a large N to a material with a small N. It's at this time in every video that I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, or leaving a question or comment in the comment section below. Now for your action plan. Here are three resources that you'll find on our website, and I've left links to each in the description section of this video. You have a Minds on Physics mission where you make measurements and perform calculations. You have a highly recommended calculator pad section where there's problems to practice using Snell's Law. And finally, there's a couple of pages in our tutorial section for brushing up on the topic. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and I thank you for watching.